morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. Coming to you on Friday, February 19th, 2021. I normally don't go live on Friday, but I am today. And we are ready for Matthew chapter 26 today. Hey, Garrett and Gail. Good morning, Wayne. Probably won't have as many on the live stream today because I don't normally go live on Friday. But that's all right. The content will still be here. And hope that you are ready to study with me from Matthew chapter 26. We're moving right on through to the last, I guess I would say, some of the last hours of the life of Christ on earth. Hey, good morning, Connie. And a lot of events take place here. Um, all four gospel writers record different aspects of what we're getting ready to study here in Matthew chapter 26. Of course, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar. Uh, John is totally unique. Um, what we are reading today in Matthew 26, if you were studying John's account, you would start reading in John chapter 12. Hey, good morning, Miss Marissa. Uh, John chapter 12, and then... Um, you know, what we have in Matthew, Mark, and Luke with the celebration of the Passover, there's relatively uh, very few verses. Now, when you look at John's account, you have John chapters 12 through 17. So quite a bit difference there. That's And that's the thing. Hey, Lyle. Uh, good morning, Leslie. Leslie with the kiddos. Well, hello, Wyatt and Anna and Caroline. You guys should be out playing in the snow, I think. But anyway, uh, I'm sure you've done plenty of that. Good to have everybody here today. John is a totally unique gospel. And, uh, hey, good morning, Tammy. Totally unique gospel. It has a very specific purpose. Um, as I've told you that before, John's stated purpose is in John chapter 20 in verses 30 and 31. Uh, the Bible there says, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. And the book he's talking about is his, John's. They're not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in His name. John only recorded seven miracles. Again, he's a totally, he's a gospel account, as we call it that, but it's a totally different, um, totally different setup, totally different purpose. Anyway, uh, so John does record quite a bit more about uh, the events that we're going to here today in Matthew chapter 26, and we're probably only going to look at the first 30 verses because there's just so much here. There are, in fact, 75 verses in Matthew 26, and we couldn't do it justice if we tried to cram all that in one 20-minute video, so we're not even going to try. Hello, Sharon from Orlando. Uh, i tell you what, Sharon, tell us what the temperature is down there. It's probably not what it is here, and you probably don't have any snow on the ground down there. All right, let's get started. Matthew 26, we have the plot here to kill Jesus. This People have been talking about killing Jesus for some time, okay? They, he's taken away the, the uh, influence of people like the Pharisees and the scribes. I mean, you just read Matthew chapter 23, and you see the... Uh, the uh, very sharp rebukes that he has for them and their hypocrisy. So let's just kill him. That's their solution. They're going to kill Jesus. But it's near the Passover. Uh, Jesus, in fact, tells his disciples here, you know that after two days is the Passover and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Now he's prophesied of this. Uh, the first time he tells his disciples of this, we have recorded in Matthew, is back in Matthew chapter 16, where he's promised to build the church and uh, right after that, he, uh, he tells them he's going to be crucified, uh, buried, resurrected. Yes, Connie, I am seeing the comments. Sharon from Thayer, 25. Well, Miss Sharon from Thayer, I'm two miles from you. I want to know what it is in Orlando, Florida. <laughs> uh, the, the Passover feast is, is what's getting ready to happen here. And it, this is a this is a big deal. I, that's the best way I know to say it. This is a big deal in Jewish life. This is one of those Passover, uh, one of those uh, feasts that was established. It was established. Uh, we have it recorded in Exodus chapter twelve when the Israelites came out of Egypt. Um, you can read details of this in Numbers chapter twenty-eight, verses sixteen through twenty-five. It was to be celebrated on the fourteenth day of the first month of the Jewish calendar. 
And uh, the Passover was celebrated that first day, but then it was followed by a week of what's called the Passover. And so, again, Exodus 12, Numbers chapter 28 will give you those details. So the chief priests, the scribes, the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest. And uh, his his name was Caiaphas. Now, Caiaphas is going to come back into the picture in uh, Matthew chapter 27 uh, in the trials of Jesus. After his, his betrayal and arrest, Jesus faces at least five different trials in one night. And Caiaphas is going to play a role in that, so we'll talk about him later. They plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him, but they said not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Well, the people, they consider Jesus a prophet. They've seen the miracles. They've heard the teaching. The Pharisees, the chief priests, the elders, they don't care about all that stuff. He's affecting the politics. He's, he's, he's taken their influence. So their solution is, let's just kill him. It shows you how evil these people are. Uh, well, in this, so Matthew is setting for us the timetable and what's kind of going on in the background um, of plotting to kill Jesus. But now we have an account here in Matthew 26, beginning in verse 6, uh, that we're given a lot more detail of in John chapter 12. <laughs> Sharon says it's 82 degrees and the air conditioner is running in Orlando. Well, Sharon, I lived in Pensacola for about seven and a half years. Um, and you can have it. Boy, I don't like the heat. Anyway, Matthew 26, 6. When Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head and he, uh, as he sat at the table. Now, you read the other gospel accounts. You see that he anointed, uh, that she anointed his head and his feet. Um, that's no contradiction, just different writers recording it in different, different ways by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Hey, Linda. Hey, Barry and Glenda uh, in Dover. Hope you guys are doing well. The amount of oil, and it's not necessarily the amount, it's not a great amount that she anoints Jesus with here, but the value of this, from what we are told, is about one year's wages. Extremely expensive that she anoints him with. And you look here in Matthew 26 and verse 8, it says, But when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Now, if we only had Matthew's account, we would miss quite a bit here. So what I'm going to do is turn over to John's account in John chapter 12. And I want to show you something here. We have to remember when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are writing their documents, they're looking back into history. They're writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but they're not writing as these events are happening. They're writing 30, 40, and with John, probably close to 60 years later. Okay, so John is recording this event in John chapter 12, um, the first eight verses. So um, it tells us that it's Mary who uh, took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, <clears throat> anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. So just a bit of a different um, angle on the story, if you will. Now, John chapter 12 and verse 4 says this, But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil sold not, uh, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii, and given to the poor. Again, that's about one year's wage for a worker in that day. Extremely expensive stuff here. And you know, if, if looking at John chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, Judas says, listen, we could have helped a lot of poor people. Well, that sounds very good, doesn't it? Um, one year's wages. A lot of folks could have been helped. Why did he say it, though, is the question. John chapter 12 and verse 6. This he said, not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. Judas was a covetous, greedy man. He didn't care about poor people. He was the treasurer, if you will. He kept the money sack. And he, was, he would steal from it. So when we look at Matthew's account, we're just told it's the disciples. John gives us a specific detail and John also tells us why Judas was indignant. Now, this also is going to play into Jesus' betrayal. 
Judas, Jesus' betrayal. Judas is a covetous man, and he will do anything for money. Let me go ahead and throw this out there. Kind of a kind of a tease, I guess you'd say. I really don't believe, from my personal studies, I really don't believe that Judas ever intended for things to go as far as they did with Jesus. And I think that some of the things that I'll show you will, will kind of bear that out. But we're not going to get into it today. But notice Jesus' response to Judas's anger. Why do you trouble the woman? Back in Matthew 26 now in verse 10. For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. Mark adds in Mark's account, chapter 14 and verse 7, he says, Whenever you want, you can help the poor. Jesus understands that his time is very short. His disciples don't get it yet. They still haven't picked up what he's telling them is going to happen in a very short period of time. He says, For in pouring this fragrant oil in my, uh, on my body, she did it for my burial. It's just a matter of days before that's going to take place. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will, all, will also be told as a memorial to her. So we are about 2,000 years removed from this event, and we still read about it. And that's what Jesus said would happen. She has done what she could. Um, she has done a good work, What verse 10 uh, is what verse 10 tells us there. And, you know, that should characterize every Christian. We should be about doing good works um, and doing for Jesus what we can, uh, just like Judas did. Now we're given a little more information about Judas, just like, uh, I'm not like Judas, just like Mary did here. Now we're given a little bit more detail about Judas here. Matthew 26, 14, one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me? if I will deliver him to you. And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. Now, this is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Uh, this, in fact, is the 18th prophecy fulfilled as recorded by Matthew. You can read about it in Zechariah chapter 11. 30 pieces of silver. If you know your Old Testament, you know that that's the price of a, a common slave. Exodus, uh, According to Exodus chapter uh, 21 and verse 32. He was willing to sell Christ for the price of a common slave. One of the twelve, okay? They've, he's, he's witnessed the miracles. He's heard the teaching. He's seen the relationship with, with people like Mary and Martha and Lazarus uh, and with himself being one of the chosen, one of the apostles. It's amazing. But he's a thief. This is his, uh, this is his temptation. This is his weakness. And uh, again, we'll, we'll talk about some more about that. We'll talk more about that when we get to Matthew chapter 27, when all of that exchange takes place. Uh, so from that time, he saw the opportunity to betray Jesus. And remember, all of this is going on in behind the scenes. Of course, Jesus knows what's happening, uh, being God in the flesh. But just like back in verse, um, verses 3 and 4 here, the high priest and the chief priest, all this, they're plotting to take Jesus by trickery. It's, it's, it's all going on behind the scenes because they know how the people of the day view Jesus. In fact, the matter of the fact, the fact of the matter is, they know who Jesus is too. They've seen the miracles. They've heard the teaching. They don't care. They just want him out of the way. They want his influence gone. So uh, they'll kill him if they have to. Now we have the record of Jesus celebrating the Passover, beginning here in Matthew 26 and verse 17. The first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that's the Feast of Passover, same thing. The disciples came to Jesus and said, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? Well, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. <clears throat> this kind of reminds me of, of back in Matthew 21, Right before the triumphal entry, Jesus told his disciples, go into the city, you'll find a uh, colt and a donkey tied, tell their owner the master needs them. So Jesus does this at least twice where it, it's a, in a sense a prophecy, predicting with his disciples, here's what you're going to do, where you're going to go, and here's what's going to happen when you get there. And this is in regard to the Passover. So the disciples did as Jesus directed them, and they prepared the Passover. 
And again, if you want a lot of details about th this is um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't record this, but John does. Start reading in John chapter 13 if you want to see some more details of what happens in the upper room. This is when Jesus, after the supper, uh, girds himself with a towel, washes the disciples' feet, teaches them about service. Uh, so there's a benefit of having, again, multiple accounts of the same life. Uh, verse 20 here, When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and they each began to ask and say to him, Lord, is it I? And his response is this, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that... Now, I want you to pay attention here to Matthew 26 and verse uh, 24. Listen to this. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. There's a common belief out there that Judas had to betray Jesus, that he was predestined to betray Jesus. Now, it is true that the Old Testament does prophesy of someone being betrayed. No question about that. And even to the specificity of for 30 pieces of silver. But when Jesus says it would have been better for him to have not been born, he's letting us know that Judas has a choice here. Um, if he were just born with a sinful nature, like a lot of people believe, he wouldn't have had a choice. And it wouldn't have, what Jesus said here wouldn't have made any sense. But he has a choice. But remember what John tells us. He's a thief. And he would steal even from the disciples' collection. Uh, John chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. Don't, don't ever forget that. Judas had a choice. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, you have said it. And that's when, of course, uh, it is revealed to us. And uh, again, John records a little bit different uh, angle, if you will. Let me turn over there just real quick. I won't spend a lot of time over here. Um, John chapter 12. And let me find it here. I wrote it down in my margin. Uh, okay, John, I'm sorry, John chapter 13, verse 21, beginning, where Jesus says, uh, Assured, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples are perplexed. And uh, Jesus' response is, John 13, 26, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas, the son, Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And then that's when Jesus says, What you do, do quickly. It, it's time. Okay, we've seen multiple occasions where, throughout Matthew so far, where Jesus has performed a miracle, and he'll say, don't go tell people. Keep, just go your way. Be quiet. Well, now it's time. It's time. Uh, God's purposes are being fulfilled here. And Judas is a, uh, he's a cog in that wheel, I guess you might say. But back to Matthew 26, Judas betrays him, or it's revealed that Judas is going to betray him. Of course, the disciples are trying to figure out who would, who would ever do this. But then the next thing that Matthew jumps to is the institution of the Lord's Supper. Now, they've been celebrating the Passover feast, and so that is the context of what's going on here. John does not record this stuff, the institution of the Supper. Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks. Now, th this stuff is very straightforward. Un the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So that's why we partake of unleavened bread today. That's how it was established. That's how Jesus told his disciples to do it. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. Now, let me say this real quick here with verse 27. There's a very common belief that you have to use one cup. Uh, it, it's been amazing to me. I've always known that that was a real belief. And, you know, if a person believes that way, it's absolutely fine. You know, if a congregation says, we're going to use one cup, there's nothing wrong with that at all. What I have run into, though, the more I've done uh, online uh, evangelism and teaching most people who believe that you have to use one cup will tell you. They've told me. 
if you don't use one cup, you will go to hell. And they're very straightforward about it, and they're very aggressive about it. Listen, if you want to use one cup, use one cup. I don't care. I've done it myself before uh, on overseas mission trips. There's not a thing in the world wrong with it. But to say you have to or you will burn in hell for all eternity uh, is another, um, that's a whole other ball game. So listen to Luke's account here, and this Luke clears it up. Um, Luke twenty two seventeen. He took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this cup and divide it among yourselves. Take the cup and divide it among yourselves. Um, then he says, For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took the bread, gave thanks. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, Luke tells us that they used multiple cups here. Luke writes an orderly account. So they're sitting there after the Passover meal. He says, take this and divide it among yourselves. Okay. Then he handles the bread. They eat the bread. And then they take their cups and they drink it. To say that you have to use one cup is to completely ignore what Luke writes. And to say that people will go to hell if they use more than one cup is just absolutely ridiculous. If you want to use one cup, that's fine. But this is a meal they were eating when the, insti- the, when the supper was instituted after the meal. They each had their own cup. It's amazing what people will do with Scripture sometime to try to prove something that they believe. And they will totally disregard Luke's account there. Again, I've had these discussions. I've had this done to me. Uh, I'm, I'm going to hell, apparently, if I disagree with them. Drink from it, all of you. Back to Matthew 26, verse 28. For this is my blood of the new covenant. Now, we know what they, were, what they had in that cup was not the blood of Jesus. It was the fruit of the vine which represented his blood, just like the unleavened bread represented his body that would soon be broken. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Well, that would be a relatively short period of time because the kingdom was established um, on Pentecost, which is just a few weeks away after uh, Passover, the day the church was established. All of this has been revealed to the disciples. They know what to do now. And they know why they're doing it. You know, if you want another account, you can read uh, 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 17. And what Paul's dealing with there in Corinthians is how the the church there had abused the Lord's Supper, and they had turned it into a common meal, and were abusing that. Um, But when you get over there, now I mentioned it, so I'm going to have to look at it. When you get over there to 1 Corinthians 11, um, Paul quotes... In verses 23 through 25, he quotes what we just read in Matthew 26. But then you get down to 1 Corinthians 11, 27. He says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. uh, Unworthy is an adverb. It's describing how they were partaking of it. Some people believe if they sinned on Friday or Saturday, then they're unworthy to take of the Lord's Supper on Sunday. That's not what we're dealing with here. It's how you are partaking of it. And the Corinthians, they had turned the the Lord's Supper, which was to be a memorial feast, they had turned it into like a big fellowship meal where people would bring their own food and some people would have too much and some people wouldn't have enough and they were abusing it. If you take it in that way, uh, Paul says here, you are guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Here's something else. Talking about the one cup. If you're going to make the argument that you have to use one cup and that if you don't use one cup, you're going to go to hell, it, it automatically follows that you have to use the same cup that they used. There's no way around that. Because when you look at Matthew 26 and verse 27, he took the cup. It's his cup. This is the one that he was using. He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from all of, drink from it, all of you. Now, we understand Luke how Luke says he told them to divide it among themselves, in that sense they would all be drinking from it. You know, if some if somebody were sitting here in my office 
and I could tell them, hey, why don't you drink some of some drink some of my cup if they were thirsty? Well, they probably wouldn't drink out of this cup. They could go get their own and I would pour some of my water into their cup. They would still be drinking from my cup in that sense. That line of argumentation that some people hold is ridiculous. Um, there's a, there is not one congregation that believes in one cup. I know of personally multiple congregations that believe in one cup, but guess what? They're not using the same cup. They all have their own. That, that belief system falls apart under very under a very small amount of scrutiny. Anyway, uh, back to Matthew 26. I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Well, we know the kingdom is the church. We know when the church was established. This, this revelation was made to the disciples of how to do this. It's done upon the first day of the week. Uh, Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Um, 1 Corinthians 11 when the disciples came together, 1 Corinthians 16, we know they came together on the first of every week. I mean, this is just, this is very elementary stuff here. Very easy to understand. And uh, elements that you can get anywhere. Unleavened bread, fruit of the vine, is accessible all over the world. Those are the elements to be used. And they are to be used at a specific time, in a specific way, and for a specific reason. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So again, we're, we're in the last hours now, uh, last couple of days before the death of Christ. Okay, that's Matthew 26, verses 1 through 30. There is a lot of information in there. I understand that. Um, hopefully, I've given you some stuff to look at and consider. Uh, if you have any further questions or comments after the stream is over, you can still access the comment section here, or you can send me a private message. I don't see any questions or comments. I see a lot of greetings. Glad to see everybody today. And appreciate you being on here on an unusual day. Like I said, normally I don't go live on Friday, but uh, today I did. So I hope you all have a good weekend. Uh, we will be live Sunday morning at 10 o'clock for our services here at Mammoth Spring. Some of you may be snowed in. Uh, some may be sick or whatever. You can access our uh, worship service on this same page on the first day of the week. Okay, here's a comment that just came in. He said, uh, David says, I read a story from a friend of mine who says in his book that there was a congregation in Texas that built our building on stilts because it said in Acts that they met in an upper room. And it does there in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Um, well, <laughs> meeting in an upper room is just a record of what they did. It's not a requirement of what we must do. Uh, people need to be able to distinguish between a command and an expedient thing to help us fulfill a command, like building a taller building so we can have an upper room. Um, you know, there in Acts chapter 20, they also had a window that a guy fell out of. I wonder if they did that. I don't know. I doubt it. Anyway, it's amazing to see what people will do with the Bible sometimes. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap it up. And uh, appreciate you being here today. Hope you have a good weekend. And uh, we will see you on the next video.